When I showed you that pair of moccasins on the other side, this is a woman's pair. And Nina has to do with life. You know, over time, they would use this to, for the women to during pregnancy and then during birth. And so this is one of the weaving looms that we have. Every now and then a student will come in and they'll add a line or two. Do you so. allow uh, non Diné um, students to come to school here? When we were having um, dinner with her was, she talked about the impact of language loss in mm. Dubai. So here we have an away tzad. It's one of you know our cradle boards and what we carry our children in. And so that's something that you know is also part of the collection. And you'll see in this photograph here, yep. it's you know, from <coughs> Bosque Redondo as well. Mm -hmm. Another photograph from Bosque Redondo. And then um, cradle board. I know it has. Whoops, I, I touched it. Um, it's okay. The the cradle board, the tying represent the CA as well too? It's, there's a, a lot of different components that go into the cradle board. You have the, you have the Shabbat Lol, which is the, the, the one that we tie the cradle board with, and then you have the lightning on the side, which, you know, is for the protection of our child. And then you have the Nod's Elid here that goes across, and then you have a small rainbow in the back and then at the bottom of it. There's a really beautiful story about the cradle board as well. And as we start to get into storytelling story season, you know, I, that's one of my favorite stories, but also the story of the hummingbird and the horned toad is another one of my favorite <laughs> stories too. So, so you know. do, do you guys have storytelling sessions here on campus? We do. We do. So um, it's easy to find we your have, website? Um, or? We don't put them on the website. Um, and this is one of the things that I've been talking about more so lately, and, um, and it's part of the recommendations that I'm making in my dissertation, is that we become more cognizant of what we um, share with outsiders. And that's one of the things I really feel like, you know, um, being Navajo and Pueblo and coming from a traditional family on both sides, Again, it's not only about balance, but it's also about us protecting, you know, who we are as people. I think for years, you know, we've given out too much information for oh. people to really, you know, kind of exploit and do other things and, you know, just kind of make a mockery out of culture, really. Well. I'm going to butt in real quick mm -hmm. to, to back up your point. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the Navajo Reddit group, the subreddit group, just slash Navajo, there's individuals in there who are actually trying to gather stories who's, who claim they are non-Dene or non-Native in general and because they want to write a story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you'll see the pushback of, no, you are doing it wrong. Right. We, oral conversations. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, just to those individuals who are thinking about doing that, I would say despite our 21st century medium, this is how we do storytelling. Mm -hmm. We do it in person. That's right. Um, really, I should not even be having a GoPro up because we shouldn't be directly always looking at each other, conversating. Mm -hmm. And there's certain stories we'll probably touch on, maybe some winter stories, maybe talks of it. Mm -hmm. But that's only because now we're in winter time and we cannot talk about it outside of winter time that's as well, right. too. That's so, right. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and that's, you know, again, that's kind of where I'm coming from as an individual is really, you know, we need to come back to a point where we're keeping sacred sacred. Yes. And a lot of our, our information now, you know, it's out there and people use it. The other side of that is they do not understand the context of it. No. And, no. you know, and that's okay because as long as they don't understand the context of it, but we do, 
then, you know, we continue to teach our children that, you know, this is why these things are important. Yep. And so, you know, again, we were, I was, when I showed you that pair of moccasins on the other side, this is a woman's pair this is here. Inya. And this is Inna on this side. <clears throat> and Inna has to do with life. And, you know, every day we get up, every day we say our prayers, every day we're moving, we're doing things, and it's part of that thinking process, that planning process. And what we give life into, you know, those thoughts, those ideas, those plans that we have, you know, it's all a part of, it's all a part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like I said, when I was putting this um, space together, it was really about making sure that we put that philosophy behind this particular space as well. And the moccasins are opposite <clears throat> of that. Yeah. They're both well used, dyed. And, then and we this also one is this one is the same way. It's dyed on the outside if mm -hmm. you look at it here. And it has really beautiful buttons. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you were to go That's if we were to, you know, take them down and bring them out, they're white on the inside. So oh, okay, I can, see it there. Yeah, yeah. Then so, and then you have a sash belt here, which a lot of us as women still use, still wear. You know, the significance about the sash belt is this is, you know, at, at, as, you know, over time, they would use this to, for the women to, um, um, during pregnancy and then during birth, they would help them. Um, they would put it over a either a log or the opening, um, of the door, the opening you know, um, a certain area, they would um, throw the sash belt over something so that the woman could pull down on that to help push the baby out. Mm -hmm. One of the neat things now is you see some Indian hospitals reincorporating this. Oh, you know, I think it's really beautiful. Um, <clears throat> um, I know there was a... A place in there was a young lady from San Aldefonso who um, had gone back to um, using traditional ways and traditional method, um, traditional methods, so that young ladies could um, birth their babies at home. Hmm. And so one of the things, especially I think here on Navajo, that she incorporated was reintroducing the sash belt as one of those measures. Nice. And so, you know, it's still really important for us. It also acts as a really good girdle. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, it'll, it'll, it'll straighten out your back and push your shoulders, you yep. know, push your shoulders back. And, you know, it, it's, it's. It's still used a lot. It's, it's used a lot today, and I'm glad. One of the things I love about being here on campus is when I see our young ladies dressed up. Mm -hmm. Next week, we have uh, Indigenous Week. Um, but, you know, every day is something different. Oh, as a first official week <laughs> of yeah, November. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's part of, you know, it being Native American Month. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, here on campus, it's every day for us. Yep. You know, so for me, when I see our children dressing up, when I see them in their kensa, their skirts, their jewelry, I see their hair up in a tzigil, it makes me feel really, really good to see our children, you know, still doing that. Also, when I see or hear about um, a kinalta taking place somewhere, oh. you know, and then if we get invited to be able to go and, you know, and see that take place as well, you know, it, it's really, it, it just really warms my heart in a different way. And that's one of the things, when we had my daughters, oh my gosh, my daughter tested me. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew she was going to do that. For some reason, I knew she would be the one to test me. But when my daughter had hers, um, we had it at the beginning of December. Mm -hmm. And so it rained, it snowed, it was windy. If any element could test us, it tested us that All first week. All four seasons week. that week. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but we got it done. Nonetheless, we got it done. Yeah. And, you know, she did really well with it. And, you know, and I always, you know, try to remind her about that. You know, there's a reason why we push you to these extents. There's a reason why, you know, young ladies are given a kinanda. It's to show you that you can persevere through anything. 
And that's oh. one of the things that's really important. This is from Bosque Redondo as well? Yeah, another photograph from Bosque. And this one, you can really see, you know, the wear and tear of her moccasins. And you can tell that they're very tight at that point. Yeah, because she's see. using every thread that you can kind of see a bump up and down. Yeah. Because they're trying to... But you can also see from her toes. Oh, you can see her toes. Yeah, you can see her toes and the way that her shoes are shaped. So you can tell that her shoes were probably really tight at that point. And then, of course, you know, just what they were enduring during that time. And so this is one of the weaving looms that we have. Um, and, you know, we Every now and then, a student will come in and they'll add a line or two. Oh, you but, actually allow the students? <laughs> yeah, oh, that's yeah. great. So we have the, you know, we have the tools in the office just because we don't want them to walk off. But we make sure that we, you know, that our, our students get to experience stuff here in the museum as well. So this is one of our hands-on, um, hands-on oh, learning nice. tools. And this was... Um, so do you have rules about students coming in to do this? Like, <clears throat> don't distract with headphones, phones? We do. I mean, it, it's really music. up to them. Oh, okay. It's really up to them how they, you know, how they, how they interact with it. Like I said, it's more of just one of our interactive pieces that we have for our students. So every now and then you'll see a student come in and add a line or two. And then this one is the sash belt loom. And so, okay. yeah, this is set up um, a little differently than that one. And then the tools for this one are also a little different as well. And this one was actually um, helped set up by, I think it was Elisio, Elisio Curley from Shiprock. <clears throat> but, you know, we work with a lot of different artists um, especially when it comes to traditional Navajo traditional arts. Um, we also have a Navajo cultural arts program that offers two degrees. Can you believe that? Wow. We have a degree in silversmithing, a bachelor's degree in silversmithing, and we also have a yes. bachelor's degree in Navajo weaving. Oh, that's what you Talking been... about yeah. cultural arts, traditional arts, and reviving the the traditional arts that we have is really, really important. And it's one of, you know, it's a really unique program that we offer here at the college. So we have sash belt making, we have basket, basketry, we have um, uh, silversmithing, and then we also have um, Navajo pottery too. Do you so, allow uh, non Diné um, students to come to school here? There are a lot of non Diné that have come to school here. Okay. I think, you know, we even have a lot of international students that come oh, to school really? here as wow. well. Yeah. That's amazing. We've had some Japanese students graduate with degrees in Diné studies, believe it or not. Nijana. So, yeah. yeah. And oh. then uh, we have several students also that have joined us from Africa. And um, I'll tell you what, they are some good runners. Well, a lot of them have run on the cross country team for the college. Oh, okay. So, you know, we when you know when I say that they're, you know, really good runners, they really are. And I think that that's one of the things, you know, we talk about um, you know, um, indigenous people coming from other areas and globalizing, you know, our our college campuses and I don't think it's not it's not just here at Dinette College that we're you know I feel like we've globalized our studies but also like you know you see it taking place at a lot of other universities and co you know college campuses throughout the United States mm -hmm. what I think is really interesting is the connection that these students make to the culture mm -hmm. and how they adapt to it because of course, you know, being indigenous people from another country and coming to a place where you actually feel comfortable, you feel at home, you're not pushed aside or pushed away, you know, because you're different, but you're actually accepted and you accept what you're being taught. You know, again, it goes back to that idea of balance. And, you know, and then at the same time, we talk about siha sin. 
can see her sin is that, you know, that reassurance of, of, or that assurance of, you know, we're exactly where we need to be when we need to be in those moments. And I'm pretty sure they feel exactly that too when yeah. they come here. Because, like right now, I feel like I w I'm meant to be here. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, and, and I love it. And that's, I would say it's kind of a universal thing. Mm -hmm. When you have a gathering of different people from different cultures and areas, yeah. And you find that one common thing, and you know everybody feels the same thing. Of uh, yeah, this is meant to be. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, AIO is a, or Americans for Indian Opportunity is a leadership program for um, you know in Native individuals. It was started by Ladonna Harris, <clears throat> who's Comanche, and she lives in Albuquerque. Oh, okay. She's a phenomenal woman. Wow, She's one that's of my, cool. She's one of my. I, I'm so thankful to have her as a mentor. And, you know, with me, I'm grateful that I've been able to bring my daughter with me to a lot of different things, not only to show her that, you know, these things can be done, but also to really share in the experience of what other people are like from around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I, you know, I love about my job, you know, is I get to meet people from people that are from all walks of life. Yeah. You know, I, I get to work with the Smithsonian Institution in the summertime during their Folklife Festival. Oh, okay. And so, you know, for me, that's also another great opportunity because I get to learn about other countries and what they're faced with. Yeah. You know, more recently, and this was last year, um, we went this year, but last year we met a young lady from Dubai and what was interesting when we were having um, dinner with her was she talked about the impact of language loss in mm. Dubai. Oh, really? And, and a lot of it is because English is becoming the, the prominent. dominant language in their country as wow. well. So, you know, when I, when I come across people like that and I sit down with them and, and we're talking about, you know, like, again, the similarities and the differences as indigenous people, it really hits me differently because I think about, you know, how lucky are we as Diné that, you know, we, we have a language, we have teachings, we have stories and the impacts of those stories that, you know, we can, you know, start to really think about how do we preserve what we have so that, you know, like I look at my grandson, I became a grandma um, a couple years ago. He'll be two in a couple of days. Actually, on Monday, he'll be two. <laughs> but I look at him and, you know, as a grandma, you think, you know, ha'ish basaladole. Oh. What's going to be here for mm -hmm. him? And then at the same time, you know, um, when we, again, are praying, we talk about, you know, the generations to come. Mm -hmm. What's going to be here for them? And again, that's why I always say, you know, when I look at these objects that are in our collection, when I look at the permanent collection here, you know, I always say, I don't consolah, so the zin salah, zin salah. You know, beta needs. It's what makes us who we are. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to carry that, we have to care for these objects in a way that, you know, they allow us to care for them. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just me opening these cases and, you know, touching them with my bare hands and, you know, and all of that but also at the same time talking to them, praying to them, you know, asking I, them, you know, those answers that I'm looking for, it's all right here. Do you, um, do you feel rejuvenated after when you do that? I do, I do <laughs> in a sense. And I think one of the things that really rejuvenates me is like when I get to go to other museums when I get to talk with other professionals in the field, when I see what other people are doing, how they're incorporating, you know, not just indigenous methodologies, but also methods in terms of caring for items. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the things that really, um, in a sense, when I come back to work, I'm excited again, I'm ready to go again, I'm ready to move forward. 
and I come back here and I'm just like, man, I'm ready to go. I'm like, what can I do? What can I keep doing to keep showcasing our museum on the level that, you know, it's being showcased. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I think about the outside community and how we want to give back to the community. What, we, what does that mean when we say we're giving back to the community? You know, I always tell artists, this is their space. Mm -hmm. You know, all I, am, all I do is make sure that it looks really pretty when yep. we put your show up. We mm -hmm. also have um, a small theater back here that we use as well. Well, for, for like lecture spaces or and, lectures and yeah um you know premieres. different yeah we've had um fashion shows on our floor oh, really? yeah nice. in fact we had a fashion show um the night we reopened during our grand reopening of the museum we had a fashion show with penny singer bonnie woody and orlando dugai um, if you know orlando and and his work you know, he's very, 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 does very beautiful garments and has a really beautiful story. He's from Tuba City. And so um, is Penny too, right? Uh, Penny is actually from Dees Oh, okay. So she's she's over, from Dees. She's, okay. Yeah, she's from over the mountain. But yeah, I mean, you is know. Is that how you refer to the Eastern is like over the mountain? Over the mountain, <laughs> yeah. Eastern and Northern? Eastern and Northern. You're either over that mountain or that mountain. And that's what you're saying for the flats, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just say I'm from Halkai on the other side. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's so. a beautiful space. Right now they're busy renovating it. Yeah. So they're painting and everything, the walls. Yeah. Different. Sneak Ooh. peek before we actually get to reopen at the end of the month with a student show. Well, so yeah. really excited about it because I have four students. Um, one student is an international student. Oh. She's from Mexico. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, so Barbara's gonna be showcasing her work here. I also have Myron Dinequa, Brandon Gorman, and um, Erica Francisco. And so each of them have their own mediums. Um, you know, I, I, I can't say enough about my students because they're just amazing in their own way. And, you know, they have a beautiful space to showcase their work. And that's what my job here is to do, is to make sure that not only do they learn the ins and outs of putting an exhibition together in their class, but they also, you know, get to learn the ins and outs of having a beautiful space and using it to the fullest potential that they can use it to. So we have a lot of archaeological ethnographical material that's housed here. A lot of these date back to the early 60s and 70s, or the late 60s, early 70s. So the person who brought these back and, and, and you know, made sure that we kept them in, as part of our collection, you know, did the right thing, I'd say.